Welcome to a new episode of Art Matters. I'm Wayne Quackenbush, your host. Today we'll be talking to two Rhode Island artists and uh, we'll get going and underway. Greetings. Uh, I'd like to introduce and welcome Jonathan Small. He's a Rhode Island artist and he has uh, quite a history of showing in various galleries and museums in the state. Jonathan, welcome to the show. Thank you, Wayne. And uh, maybe you can give us a little bit of history about uh, what, how you developed your interest in art and what your education was. Sure. Um, well, I always had sort of an aptitude for art. I can recall my uh, mother bringing me to the MFA as a little tyke and just being, like, when I was exposed to those magnificent paintings, just took my breath away. Um, Are you originally from Rhode Island? Or no, Rhode Island? I grew up in Wayland, Mass. Oh, okay. um, and uh, in my family there has been a history of art. Um, my grandmother uh, was an aspiring artist. She went to the uh, school of the MFA um, on a scholarship. But then she met her future husband and in those days women chose between a career or being a wife and mother and so she became a wife and mother. Unfortunately, I would really have liked it if she had been able to do both. Um, and then her grandfather was a, a very talented artist, a fellow named Stephen Schaff, who uh, was an engraver and was well known. He was a member of the National Academy, um, did a lot of portraiture and the books that were published in the 19th century. Very famous. Uh, Amongst portrait. certain people, he's yeah. famous. Yeah. Um, yeah. I probably know more about him than any living person because I study quite a bit about him. Right, in his family yeah. history too. Yeah, right. But anyway, I'd like to think that maybe genetically a little bit of that seeped into me. Um, but in any case, uh, I went to college at the uh, University of Colorado, studying environmental design with hopes of being an architect. And that didn't get me much into my sophomore year before I realized that uh, that wasn't really what I was cut out to do. Uh, I was taking art classes there as well. And I had the realization that I needed to kind of put a hold on things and take uh, stock in where I was heading in life. Ended up actually getting into music for a while. I was. Uh, I went to a broadcasting school in Boston, uh, did some radio for a little bit, managed record stores, had a mail order business with underground music, punk rock and that sort of stuff. All right. Yeah. And, um, and that's when I decided I need to go back to art school. So uh, I took classes at uh, the School of the Museum of Fine Arts and uh, Mass Art in Boston. Um, But I still didn't get going as a professional. Uh, I ended up coming to Newport um, as a waiter because the restaurant where I was working in Massachusetts closed for the summer, and the whole staff decided on mass that we would we would work in Newport for the summer. And I ended up just staying here. Uh, got into windsurfing. Uh, worked at a, a windsurfing shop in the area. And then really um, got back into the art. This was about 15 years ago, and art's been full time ever since. So did you paint and draw during all of those years? Or was Here and there. Was you there? know, when I was working in the windsurfing industry, mm -hmm. I did some surfboard design and mm -hmm. um, some advertising work. Yeah. Um, that was fun. Yeah. yeah. So the, this uh, painting. The, that you're working on now um, is a relatively new venture and, and pretty much full time, from what I understand. Yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm semi-retired, but you know. This well, you're you're pretty prolific from your website. I can see that you've been pretty. Yeah, every day, working. every day, I like to get into the studio and work. Yeah, yeah. Um, if I'm not painting, I'm at least stretching canvases or doing something to uh, keep it going. Yeah. Keep it going. yeah. And uh, you're represented by. Uh, well, you show in, in different venues across uh, Rhode Island. I know you show in Newport. Um, have you ever 
shown that the Portsmouth Arts Guild, mm -hmm. um, you, you're definitely associated with the Providence Art Club. Yep, I've been there for uh, just about uh, seven years now. Yep, yep. So uh, you can start showing your work uh, so we can get an idea of what okay. you do. Um, In no particular order. This is called Birches by the Bay. Uh, it's done uh, from a photograph Maybe I took. You should hold it vertically so that the camera can see it. Yeah, like so. Yep. Birches by the Bay. It was uh, from a photograph I took on Great Diamond Island in Casco Bay, uh, where my wife and I spent our uh, anniversary a couple years ago. I got some inspiration on this one from a painter named Luigi Lucioni who was an uh, Italian-American painter, and he, he did a lot of paintings of um, birch trees. Uh -huh. Typically, he worked in Vermont. There's this one. It's by the water. I do a lot of tree paintings. <laughs> yes. This one, forest light, um, based on uh, some photographs and sketches I did at Goddard Memorial State Park. Um, with this particular painting, I was really thinking about getting the values right. That you know, when I talk about values, I mean brights versus darks, because right. it's so important with uh, the lighting. Um, That's what makes things pop. Yep. Yeah, my daughter was um, taking her driver's ed lessons over there at the time uh, at the school right near there, so I was. I had to find something to do at uh, 7 in the morning, so that's this is an early morning light image. Now, do you usually work from photographs, or do you...? Uh... I often do. Uh -huh. um, I do do a fair amount of plein air work, and I kind of hybridize them sometimes. Like, one thing I like to do is, if I know I'm going to be painting in a certain area outdoors, I like to visit it the day before at about that time of day, and really think about where I'm going to paint, maybe mm -hmm. take pictures, right. and then from those pictures I'll decide what my composition will be and I'll go back and, and Well obviously you, me head it's, it's really hard to maintain the light if you're there in person. Right. And yeah, but basically anything this size, this scale, mm -hmm. I've done it in my studio. Mm -hmm. uh, my outdoor work tends to be smaller and sketchier. So most of what I'm showing here today are It looks like you're going to show us a lot of landscapes. Yeah, that's what I mostly paint. Um, I did a fair amount of portraiture for a while when I got back into art, uh, and I found that uh, portraiture, there's a lot of headaches with it. Yes. <laughs> you know, you get somebody, you think you've done the perfect painting, and you know, they don't like the way their nose looks. And, right. So yeah. There's always the uh, personalities get involved. Yeah. The trees aren't going to complain if you don't exactly get the tree right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and basically came down to my wife and I discussing what sort of art, if we were collecting, what would we want on our walls? And it was right. landscape. So I said, well, if that's what we want, if I don't sell it, we can at least hang it in our house. Well, you also <laughs> live in a very picturesque environment, and uh, these uh, seascapes and, and forestscapes are definitely in demand, I would assume. Yeah, I'd like to think so. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's a story behind this one. It's called Paradise, a homage to John Lafarge, um, and it all came from the frame. You can uh -huh. see this this wooden frame is different than my other work. Yeah. My wife picked up an old mirror at a yard sale in Newport, and the glass eventually broke, and I was taking a look at the frame, thinking, well, maybe I could put a painting in it, and on the back of the painting, I found an old shipping label, and it was to John Lafarge, uh -huh. 10 Sunnyside Place, which was his address where he lived in Newport. Yeah. So with that in mind, I thought, well, I've got to do a painting that's inspired by Lafarge. So this was a painting done where the Great Craig Estate is overlooking Second Beach, um, where he often painted. He painted uh, up and down Paradise Avenue, which is not far from here. Um, there's a, there's oh, that's a real connection to history there. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, there's a, there's a professor at uh, Salve University, uh, James Yarnow, mm -hmm. who's like the foremost expert on Lafarge. And uh, reading his book, I, I picked up a lot of information about Lafarge and where he painted and how he painted. So this one doesn't look like my other paintings because 
I was letting Lafarge kind of yeah, channel the through me. You. Am I taking too long here? Uh, we got to pick up the pace. All and right. Show more. All right. Uh, a Rising Tide. This one made it into the uh, members show at the Newport Art Museum a few years back. It's one of my gray paintings. I like to uh, do rocks in foggy conditions. I don't use any black to achieve the grays. They're all mixed from other colors, reds, blues, yellows. Nice. Yeah. Now, do you work from dark to light? or? Yes. Yeah. Pretty much. That's, that's very traditional. Yeah, unless you're a watercolor painter. Right, exactly. You have to do the opposite. So you get the you get the ceruleans to pop over top. Do you do glazes or not much? Uh -huh. The the Lafarge one was glazed, but generally speaking, it's all a la prima. I like to spend I spend a lot of time mixing my colors uh, I'm sure you before do. I apply the brush to the canvas to get it just right. The big decision making process. Yeah. Uh, this is another one from Casco Bay. It's called Jewels of the Jewels of the Woods. Um, inspired by a painting by Child Hassam, who did one called The Jewelry Box, a similar kind of scene with the uh, light shining through the trees. Or was he associated with uh, Connecticut? Yeah, it was an old line painting That's that he, right. that he yeah. did. Um, we, we took a short break to put on warmer clothes and um, we're back and Jonathan is going to show us some more paintings. Now what, uh, <clears throat> what is the main thing that attracts you to uh, uh, a landscape when you start working? Oh, it's hard to really put into words because it's, it's more of an instinctual thing of just finding something fascinating and, and beautiful. Um, but, you know, beyond that, maybe if there's some history to the, uh, the area, uh, somewhere where artists might have painted in years past, uh, I'm more inclined to want to visit there and see if I can see what they saw, reinterpret it. But also the, the interplay of the forces of nature and maybe light. Absolutely, uh, yeah. I'm dynamic. always fascinated with the play of light on mm -hmm. a landscape. Yeah. Uh, so you have a few that we... That you can show us still. Um, start with that uh, one. Yeah, oh, this is. Uh, you can pick it up. Okay, this is in mm -hmm. Gunquit, Maine, Perkins Cove. And so uh, this is one of those places where artists have congregated uh, over the decades, um, and uh, they've got this beautiful drawbridge there. And I caught a scene of the sailboat passing through. That's the name of the title, passing okay. through. Kind of reminds me of Mystic, Mystic Connecticut. Mm -hmm. That one you show, I think. Yeah, this is um, Castle Rock mm -hmm. in uh, Devon, England, in a town called uh, Lynmouth. Uh, it's known as the Switzerland of England. I went there uh, seven years ago with my family for a little vacation. Okay. And. Uh, Oh, you want me to talk about the ones we haven't? We haven't seen yet, okay. because we have footage on the... Okay, I'm sorry. Yep, no problem. I was repeating myself yep. then. All right, this is um, Rough Surf at Rough Point. And of course, that's right out here on the Cliff Walk in Newport. Yep. Um, I had to kind of get out on the rocks a little bit to get that view. Was that plein air, or did you take pictures? Uh, this is from a little plein air study. Okay. That's the way I often work, is yep. I'll do a smaller one on site. Do you like painting water? I do. I love painting water. I love the, the... I know a lot of artists who like to paint water because water is really difficult. It's a real challenge. Yeah, but be. it's also forgiving because it's fluid, you know. Yes. It, if you uh, make a mistake, it can be just a wave that you put in, you know. Mm -hmm. Whereas uh, a hard object, it's got to be exactly right. Yeah, people can exactly right. definitely tell you if something's wrong. Yeah. An object. <laughs> yeah. Uh, this is another uh, Narragansett Bay scene. A view off of uh, Goat Island, looking out towards Jamestown. Yeah, this was from a photograph. You can't work fast enough to catch that no, sun catch going that down. Light, you know? Five minutes at best to yep. do that. And I think we didn't cover this one, perhaps. Correct. Uh, this is called the Charlestown Breachway over in Charlestown, Rhode Island. Um, this was a plein air study. Uh, finished up though in the uh, studio 
at the Providence Art Club. So if you've noticed anything changing for you since you've been, we've all been dealing with the uh, pandemic? Um, <laughs> I don't know. Uh, not really. So I wanted to just take a second to thank you, Jonathan, for spending time with us and sharing your work. It's been my pleasure, Wayne. Thank you for um, giving me the opportunity to let everybody take part and see it. Okay, thanks. Now, I was recording while you were doing that. Oh, that's fine. Now, and am I, am I'm going to zoom up on that, too. Or whatever. <laughs> so tell me when to start. Okay, so today on Art Matters, we have a young artist who I've known for, oh my God, I don't even want to say, probably 25 years. This proves how old you are. Casey, now known as Silver. Used to be Sylvia. Either way, I'd, um, I'd, 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 it was when I first started out. I was like, I want a cool, different name, you know. Like Stan Lee didn't write under his name. It's kind you of know. cyberpunk. It is, you know, and uh, exactly. <laughs> well, so. Casey's a comic book colorist, a professional comic book colorist. But the way that he got into the field is uh, a little convoluted. Um, you can first, I guess, start saying, tell people what a colorist is. Sure. Yeah. Uh, so for comic books. Um, you know, they come black and white from the artist. A lot of times, uh, the artists, especially on monthly books, don't have time, you know, to do it. So there's what's known as a colorist, where you take black and white pages and you turn them into color. And it's more just filling in, more than just filling in the lines. You know, you're creating a mood and an atmosphere. The most you can, I can liken it to is like being a cinematographer on a movie. Right. You know, where you're really trying to get the kind of depth and rendering and things. And Well, you're, you know. Uh, you're kind of recreating reality, but you're augmenting it for emotional purposes. Exactly, and, exactly. Uh, the one thing that, it, that I know about you that is unique for colorists is that you're colorblind. It's true. I, I am, I'm not completely colorblind, but reds, blues, purples, and browns, and dark greens, they're all kind of nebulous together. So your, your you tertiary know? colors are kind of all blending together. They're all blending together, which, thank God for, you know, the computer, because I, when you look on Photoshop or whatever, you know they've got the box that's like at the top oh, is yeah, light colors, at the bottom is the dark colors. Yes. So I actually do everything in gray, okay. you know, and I, I do it like that, and then I just color pick, you know, from wherever and make sure. So if I was doing Superman, I would just do it gray, and then I would find a picture of Superman and be like, you know, color pick. I would pick that red for right. his cape and put it over it. Okay. You know, so that helps me get a, get around. Uh, you know, not being able to see completely the colors. Right. I you know, you. so as long as your tone is right, you know, as long as it's black and white, it works. Then but your your stuff is completely unique because of it. Your palette is is different. Yeah. Than what I usually see. I know you have a tendency, from what my experience, to work in the kind of violet purple range and and then on the other side the lots of oranges and yellows yep yep i love i love i, I grew up in the early 90s so i'm a you know sucker for 90s cyberpunk and kind of acid colors and fluorescent stuff and right. that whole like spray paint thing you know that was big um, well there's a you know. marginal attempt at graffiti too exactly yeah, exactly because so graffiti's been around for a long time and i just remember in the 90s as a kid having these like airbrush magazines right you know because there was there was a huge thing of just the actual airbrush doing paintings and fantasy stuff especially that must you have know. made a big comeback because that was big in the 70s exactly and it did it came back in 90s my dad used to take me to this this uh, magazine store that was no longer here Newsbreak. Yep. and uh, they would have all sorts of great art stuff and i was always attracted to it because it was shiny and there was yes. something about the texture I realize that there's something about the texture in old photos, which probably comes from my father because he's a photographer, right. and the, the spray paint, and that's what I'm constantly like trying to get back to. Right, I got you. Is like that kind of feel, but you know. You're you've always been kind of a comic book fan, and, and I met you when you were eight years old, and you were uh, making uh, some headway into looking at Spawn, not the Spawn comic book, and how it was forbidden for kids, and yep. That was one of our first encounters. It was. But uh, over the years, we kind of spent a lot of time together in this comic book store that was around back then. And you, I saw you grow up, basically. I saw you with uh, 
comic books and, and getting into different artists and getting into movies and kind of expanding your horizons in lots of different ways. Absolutely. And uh, Yeah, I mean, you know, th this man here gave me my education, you know, like truly. I, I wouldn't be creatively who I was if it wasn't for Wayne. Well, you know? your father's photography has a... Absolutely. You know, I mean, I've had, like, it's funny looking back, you know, where you can kind of chart your influences. Yeah. But, uh, you know, the store that, that I grew up in, I, that, that's it. I, I grew up there and, you know, I was exposed to all sorts of things that when I, when I moved out, um, you know, was unique knowledge. And then I ran, managed to move to a place where that was common knowledge which and that was perfect. Seattle. Which you is Seattle. You worked for years in a, in a now defunct store called Xanadu. Yep. And, um, you got to meet some comic book professionals, and you, your um, desire to get into the industry was sparked. Yep. You wanted to be a writer. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, and you saw that a lot of people wanted to be writers because comic books are a good way to get your screenplay out there and get it storyboarded for possible film use. So everybody's writing for comics now in one way or another. Yeah. So you met you must have met some professionals i did i did so while i was being being in seattle obviously there's a lot more people who work on who work in comics uh in the northwest than than here right you know and so i was very fortunate i worked there for like 12 years mm -hmm. um and the best part other than you know working in a comic book store was to be able to meet a lot of talent and i was very fortunate to, to uh, befriend a guy named mortat who has become my uh kind of sensei as it were you know, I kind of apprentice under him, uh, very like kung fu movie style, where like I carry rice up like yeah. top, you know things of stairs and Mr. don't understand. Yeah. You know, um, so yeah, and through through him and some other people, I met a real good crew of of people who uh, I now share a studio with, mm -hmm. which is really cool. Um, and yeah, I started on writing, but as you said, it's just it's so hard to get into and into the industry. And so I started, I managed to meet a, an illustrator who was looking for a writer. Mm -hmm. And that never happens. You know, it's always a writer looking for an illustrator. Right. And it's very hard to get anyone who's not emotionally invested in your story to draw it for free. Mm -hmm. Because why would you? Right. And so I was very lucky to meet uh, a man named Dimi Meharis. And together we uh, founded 80% Studios. And where does 80% come from? 80% uh, comes from, uh, so Dimmy, um, we both love the Turtles. And our mutual friend that works the Teenage, the Teenage, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. As opposed Turtles. to the 60s folk pop. Band. Yes, as opposed to, the, yeah, so the TMNT. We're both, you know, 80s, 90s kids. Right, right. And so a friend of ours actually works for the Turtles cartoon for Nickelodeon. And yeah. so they needed an artist, so Dimmy tried out. And the guy sent it to him, and he looked at it, and he was like, you're pretty good, but you're 80%. And so we thought oh, of that, and we were like, oh, well, screw it, great. you know what? We're going <laughs> to dig this trench at 80%. We're going to sit in it, we're going to put our middle fingers out, and we're going to make comic books. Yep. And so that's what we did. And we, um, we started with our, our first title called Gutter Town. It was, our, it was our very, very first self-published uh, project. Um, it's a whole full color comic book yeah. uh, that I wrote and helped color, and then Dimmy did the rest. Um, and uh, we came up with four basic properties, and we were going to kind of continue from there. Um, and you know, life gets in the way, but we managed to do like four of these issues, which was really hard. Self publishing is crazy, but it's something I feel like everyone should do because it's one thing to make a comic, it's another thing to promote your comic, it's another thing to sell your comic on the floor of a comic book store. Mm -hmm. Those are all vastly different skills, Absolutely. and I'm very lucky because I came all the way around. I've been a fan, I've published comics, I've written comics, I've made comics, you know, I've done. For hire, and I know what it takes to sell that comic on the floor. You know what it takes to get somebody to part with four dollars right. for a right. comic. And you know how hard that is. Yeah, of course. You know, I mean, it's crazy. You gotta and have a hook. You gotta, you gotta grab them with the first picture, the first paragraph. You gotta have a cover. cover. Exactly. You gotta have something that's, you know, uh, that's eye catching. You know, so like we went with just a total white kind of thing. Yep. So that helps. You know. Yeah, as long as you don't use the color yellow, and apparently there's a there's a prejudice against using yellow covers. In really? Comic books. Yeah. Yellow really? Covers apparently don't sell. <laughs> and that's the thing. There's all like comic book people are weird. I say this is comic book people. Weird. We're so weird. You know, we're so bizarre, and it'll be like, oh, I don't want to buy that because it's like an inch bigger. You're like, oh, okay. Right. You know, it won't but fit in a bag. That's exactly. Yeah. Exactly. 
Um, but yeah, so we, we've been doing 80% Studios for like 10 years, um, making stuff, and then I've just recently been able to um, transition to doing freelance work, uh, which is really cool. Working on a, a or my first book well, for Image Comics was Gunning for Hits, right. which was written by uh, David Bowie's ex-record producer, oh, Jeff Rogvi. That connection. I so that's why, so he, he uh, was one of the main guys at Ryko Disc, right. and he also created, he created the CD box set. Oh, the wow. whole model of it. So he's a big dude in the in the whatever. Yep. And now at this point he's just older. You know, he's not old, but older. Yep. And he just wants to make comics. And so we had all these stories about the record industry. Mm -hmm. And he mixed that with kind of like this John Cusack hitman thing. Mm -hmm. And that's gunning for hits. Yep. Um, and so that was my first kind of crash course into it. Um, and uh, from there I've been slowly kind of getting other jobs. And working on my skills, you know. And... Uh, uh, I'm now just doing uh, Rat Queens for Image yep. Comics, which yep. is really cool. Um, but it's been weird. It's been a wild ride. Like, when I first, when I got a job, he, you know, at the old comic book store, I thought it was, my, it was the greatest thing in my life. And then when I moved to Seattle and was able to pay rent, <laughs> to a bigger comic you know, at the comic book store, store I again right? thought was the greatest thing, yep. you yep. know? And it's, it's very, I feel very fortunate yeah. for all the steps that I've taken and the people that have been there to help me along the universe the way. is ever expanding. It, it is, you know, and you put that positive energy in, and it comes <laughs> out, that hippie stuff, it works, you know? It's well, that, 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 that Seattle talking. That, yeah, you know, I get, I've been out there for a long time. Right, I got you. You know? Um, so who, are you, who would you cite as uh, artistic influences? Uh, Kirby, definitely. Yeah, is, is, yeah, and I've got but this great Kirby shirt that I got from the Kirby Museum, which is a phenomenal, like, you know, internet museum. Uh, it, Don't they have a physical museum? I thought they were in North Jersey. Somewhere. They they might have a small one, like a store or something. One of my old friends from uh, Hoboken runs it works with them. Randy, oh, cool. Randy Hop. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah. Oh, cool. So yeah, maybe I don't know they they had a, a booth at a con. Yeah. You know, and so I got that. So definitely Kirby, um, Mobius. Yep. Uh, a lot of a lot of manga artists have been really like uh, uh, Sutomo Nihei, who does Blame, uh, Toriyama, Dragon Ball stuff. I mm -hmm. love that. Um, Ichiro Oda, I've been reading a One Piece lately, which has been cool. Um, there was um, James Stoko I like a lot. Um, you know, Ditko, stuff like that. Like a good mix of stuff that I was introduced to from you. Yep. You know, a lot of the classic Silver Age, the EC artists, mm -hmm. which is just phenomenal, you know, talent there. And the fact that in the Silver Age, these guys were doing this, you know, monthly. And, uh, and it was just crazy, the skill, you know. But as I've grown, I've... I've I feel like my taste actually has gotten worse as I've gotten older. Uh, I can, I you can know, completely agree. I, I've I been, like stuff now that I would just like poo poo when I was exactly. Younger, like, oh, that's garbage. Exactly. You know. So my my main thing now with comics is just to, you know, then nothing has to be perfect. It just you know the real Kirby thing where you know you break the Kirby barrier. You you just do it and move on. Do it and move yeah, on. The Kirby next panel as, a, as an influence. Yeah. You can't go wrong because he was a master storyteller. Yeah. And. Um, he was always about the dramatic, and, and everything about comic books is kind of encapsulated in his work because it has Absolutely. to be it, it has to be crazy and grand on some level, even if it's a drama, even if it's a soap opera. Is it because if it's just like real world, then why are you reading? You right. go outside. You get to you get to you know? explore nuances you can't experience in real life or in any other medium. It's completely different. It is. Comic books are the greatest medium in the world. They, they, and pictorial storytelling is some of the oldest form Absolutely. of human communication yep. that exists. It's very primal. The comic books are very powerful, and there's something in them that you don't get from movies, you don't get from you know any other adaptation, anything like that. Yep. It's just the comic itself. And we so. got a break right now. Thank you very much for coming by and spending your time back here in Newport. Thank you for having me. Seattle. This is great. Thanks Thank very you. much. Thanks, guys. Oh, set.